Okay, it is um, my pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker. This, um, and I'm standing in for Kent Barrage, so I don't have an elaborate uh, speech <laughs> prepared. Kent got stranded in Dallas with the Southwest um, cancellation. So he is very sorry that he can't be here, but I am thrilled to be able to introduce today's Elliot Valenstein lecture. And just so you know, Elliot Valenstein um, has a distinguished uh, professor here, um, one of the founders of the uh, neuroscience program here and um, the biopsychology area chair uh, when I first joined uh, at the University of Michigan. Um, and he was one of the uh, founders of the field of behavioral neuroendocrinology. Um, his early work was uh, read by everyone who's in uh, behavioral neurochronology and his contributions are so many that um, I'm not even gonna try to tell him, but I'm really thrilled that he's here with his son, Paul and Marsha is here, so um, Paul's wife. Um, so I'm really glad that they got to be here. Um, and uh, thanks so much to Elliot for um, donating the money that allows us to have this uh, uh, series of lectures. So today's uh, speaker, um, William Newsom, is from uh, Stanford University. He got his uh, bachelor's degree in physics from Stetson University and his PhD from Caltech. He uh, started off as an assistant professor at the uh, Stony Brook, the State University of New York at Stony Brook, and then moved to Stanford University, where he has been the rest of his professional life. He is. Um, he does everything from visual perception and visual cognition to the neural basis of motivation and uh, influence on decision making, which is what we're going to hear about today. But he's also a member of the National Academy of Science and American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Science. So he's a very distinguished uh, professor with many honors um, that uh, the Carl Spencer Lashley Award from the American Physical Philosophical Society, for example. Um, there are just too many to mention them all um, because I would be taking away from his time. And really, what we want to do is hear um, about his uh, work. So, with my, uh, with your help, I'd like you to help me um, welcome Bill Newsom uh, to this talk. Thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Somehow in all of my perambulations around academia over the years, I have never been to Ann Arbor. This is my first trip to Ann Arbor. And uh, when I was talking with Kent, we Kent, we scheduled it carefully for October. I said, I'd love to see some of that Midwestern fall foliage. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine as I was coming in on the airplane yesterday, looking down and it's all green still. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a few patches of color, but uh, it means I'll just have to come back in late October sometime and pick it up, I guess. Um, it's a pleasure to visit Ann Arbor, you know, one of the storied American public universities in the world and uh, 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 storied college campuses as well. And uh, it's uh, doubly a pleasure to give this talk today in honor of Elliot Valenstein, who uh, I have never met until just about 45 minutes ago. But he doesn't know it, but he's been an influence on my career. Uh, as, as Sherry said, I... Uh, um, started out as a physics major as an undergraduate and went into neurobiology in graduate school. When I started graduate school in neurobiology, I didn't know an axon from a dendrite. I knew that one was in and one was out, but I would have to flip a coin if you forced me to make a choice. And I started reading and one of the books I read was Elliot Valenstein's book that was out new at the time on brain control. You, you, you remember this, this book? And um, it, it was very influential. It was like, it, you know, it introduced me to so many phenomena, uh, including brain stimulation reward that I teach to Stanford medical students even now as a way into talking about motivation and talking about dopamine and such. So um, Elliot, it's a, it's a honor to give this award in your name and it's a pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to meet you. And thank you for everything you've done for the field. I really appreciate it. So today I'll be talking about um, something you know that, that was just a gleam in my eye for decades, I think, and many of us for decades, 
uh, being, being able to do something like tracking covert decision states inside a primate, and uh, there will be non-human primates today, but I think this can be done in humans eventually, uh, via neural population recordings in prefrontal cortex. And let me say at the outset that this is a collaborative piece of work between my lab and Krishna Shinoi's lab, uh, an outstanding double E uh, laboratory at Stanford who work on real-time decoding of neural signals in order to drive motor prosthetics. Uh, Cindy Chesnick, who's a faculty member here at Michigan, was a, a postdoc or graduate student, one or the other, maybe both, in Christian's lab. So I've known Cindy for quite a while, and, and it's that, that kind of work that, I, has, that we have married to our own decision-making work in order to make this kind of study possible. So um, all of us who sort of do neurophysiology are familiar with this problem of seeing irregular trains of action potentials flying by on our oscilloscope screens and not being able to interpret for sure whether a burst of spikes like this signifies something important about what's going on inside the animal or whether it's just stochastic firing created by the biophysics of neurons, right? And historically, the, uh, we depended on averaging across trials uh, as shown on the left here. This is a raster plot of about 10 different trials with a repeated onset of a visual stimulus. And when you line 10 trials up in time like that, you can see perfectly well that these little bursts are, are created, elicited by the visual stimulus. And you average them in a raster plot, the, the time-honored post-stimulus time histogram that was a workhorse analysis feature for 50 years for our field, um, then you can see perfectly well. And then uh, I, I was raised in the visual sensory tradition, but people in the motor uh, field would do the same thing. They would line up individual trials on the onset of a saccadic eye movement or a reach movement, and you can see uh, what's related to the movement and what isn't. Uh, the problem, of course, that most of our cognition, the interesting kinds of thinking and feeling that we do, cannot be repeated uh, identically over and over again and then averaged across time to tell what neural correlates or what neural mechanisms are lying underneath. So for example, um, a world uh, great chess player, or even your average 12 year old who's head of her or his local chess club uh, can look at a chessboard and think many moves into the future and analyze different positions and be given away by nothing more than the occasional eye movement, the occasional scratching of the head. And yet there's all this rich flow of mental life going on. And I, I think a, a holy grail for our field at some point when it's really a mature field will be able to record from the brain or make measurements from the brain and actually be able to follow that kind of fluid thinking in real time. But what I wanna tell you about today are some steps that we are taking, which I consider baby steps toward that kind of ultimate goal. So the challenge, as I've just said, is that something like decision formation, and I'll be talking about decision formation, simple perceptual decisions today, it's an inherently variable process. And it's also inherently covert in that each step of the decision decision process is not given away by some external thing that we can measure necessarily. So the approach that we'll take is to do neural population recordings. Instead of getting our statistical power by repeating trials and recorded with, recording with one electrode, we will analyze each trial one at a time, but we'll have many looks at it from, in this case, a Utah electrode array over here, this uh, famous bed of nails thing that gives you 100 electrodes at shot. And I'll say a bit more about that at the moment. And, and I'll address two major questions during this talk. One is, can we reliably decode intentions or decision states in real time on single trials? And then two, can we detect cognitive phenomena that we're all familiar with, um, but things like changes of mind in real time on single trials? And uh, I'll say a couple of words about some other things if I have time at the end, but I probably won't. So we'll just see how this goes. So I, I wanna to appeal to your intuition about certain decisions you have to make in real time that where you vacillate between alternatives. You're cruising down the road, a light turns from green to yellow and you vacillate. You know, Do I step on the accelerator? Do I hit the brakes? Maybe you actually do two or three things before you make a final decision to gun through the intersection or actually you know, stop very suddenly. And it's those kinds of decision states where we're hovering right around a threshold and where we can 
have different states of mind that we focus in on on this kind of study. And we do this with visual stimuli, random dot motion stimuli that we've used for many years to study visual psychophysics and decision making. And I'm going to play some of these for you. You're going to see a circular aperture of random dots. They're going to be in motion. And your job is very, very simple, just like a monkey's job is very simple to tell me which direction of motion you see. So um, here's a trial. And most of you can see that the dots are moving to the, there you go, good monkeys. You get, you get, a, you get a reward. Now that one was very easy. And for, for our monkeys in the lab, we, we can train monkeys to indicate this perceptual choice, either by making eye movement to one of two targets that we present, or in most of the data I will show you today, making uh, arm movements. So the monkeys are touching a touch screen and they simply move their finger from one to the other. And I'll, again, I'll unpack that for you a little bit more. But first of all, that was a very easy trial. 90% of those dots were moving to the left and there were only 10% providing that twinkling noise. It's okay. So most of you, there was no vacillating decision state. You saw it, you knew it, you reported it when I asked you to report it. Um, but here it gets a little bit tougher though. This is still easy. Most of you can probably see that that motion is exactly. Okay. Now that was about 50% coherent motion. And now we'll move to a little harder one. This one is only about 10%. So what direction did you see? A lot of lefts. It was left. I, I might have heard one or two rights, I'm not sure. But you were a little more hesitant. The volume wasn't quite as loud. And when I do these things, and I've done thousands of these things, I, I can actually be thinking left, but then become convinced it's right. And sometimes I'll even change my mind after the dots are finished, um, which is a puzzle. I mean, why you would do that when there's no more information coming in is, is a whole separate question. Now, this last one here is 0% coherent motion. So if I ask you to tell me the direction you saw, you know, you, you can say anything and be right because that's a white noise stimulus in the motion domain, okay? You can, you can actually, it contains all directions equally, although it contains different directions, sort of different points in time, depending on the stochastic nature of the random dot generator. But it's this, this is what I want to appeal to you. This is the monkey's uh, uh, opportunity to gain rewards. It's also the monkey's dilemma because the monkey does not know the correct choice in advance and has to really work hard in order to solve this task. Now, um, here's a sketch, an outline of the behavioral task. So uh, it starts with a monkey facing a uh, LCD screen, fixation point comes on, the monkey has to fix his eyes on that fixation point and has to reach out and touch it with his finger, okay? So we're monitoring both eye movements and hand movements. Um, after 300 milliseconds, these two targets come on, the monkey knows he's gonna to have to move his hand to one of those two targets in order to get a reward. And then uh, the random, after about half a second of that, the random dot motion comes on. And for you, I showed you, I was easy on you. I showed you a full two seconds of motion. For our monkeys, they get anywhere from a half to 1.2 seconds uh, random duration most of the time. Though sometimes we do some fixed duration tasks. And then uh, the dots go off and there's a delay period that varies you know, from, in this case, from 0.4 to 0.9 seconds. And the monkey has to continue fixating both with eye and fingers right here until he receives the go signal. The go signal is just the disappearance of that fixation point. And when that fixation point disappears, then he has permission to go and uh, he can move his finger to the uh, right if he saw a rightward motion, to the left if he saw a leftward motion, and he gets a reward for a correct choice. For the 0% coherence trials, uh, he gets rewarded with a probability of 0.5 randomly, okay? So these monkeys are working hard. They always know they have a shot at getting rewarded. But we have this delay period in here for about 30% of the trials. But for most of what I'll talk about today, we actually don't have a delay period. So the go signal, that is the disappearance of the fixation point and the disappearance of the dots takes place at the same time. And as soon as those dots disappear, then the monkey can go and reach. And most of the data I'll show you come from these kinds of trials, though not all. The monkeys learn this task very nicely. These are classic psychometric functions that show the probability of a correct response as a function of the strength of the motion signal. So when the motion coherence is high, these monkeys are extremely well-trained and they're operating 98 to 100% correct typically. Uh, they drop down you know, to 80% correct at something uh, a certain threshold. And of course, by the time you get down to you know, one or 2% motion or zero, they're operating at chance. 
So uh, this is just to demonstrate that the behavior here is under control. I tell undergraduates sometimes when I'm introducing them to these kinds of metrics, when you can see beautiful psychometric functions like this, you know that that animal's behavior is chained to the stimulus. He's not thinking about his date on Saturday night. He's not thinking about how bad his mama or daddy were to him when he was growing up. He's only thinking about those dots. Those dots are the payoff here. That's what the monkey's really interested in. This is motivation, Elliot. Um, so uh, our, our strategy here is to use these multi-electrode arrays. Uh, we implant two of them, 96 electrodes per array. Uh, this is intrasurgically. It shows you, uh, this is the central sulcus for those of you who are familiar with the non-human primate brain. This is the front of the brain up here. This is the arcuate sulcus where the frontal eye fields lives. And this array is sitting right in the smack of the arm region of premotor, dorsal premotor cortex. And this is sitting in the arm region of uh, M1 or primary motor cortex. And so each of these monkeys is outfitted with two of these arrays. And uh, there's some interesting things to compare between M1 and M PMD, though that's not gonna be a main, a primary theme of this talk. Mostly we're gonna be using them together. Uh, so, uh, get about 100 units distributed between these two arrays. And I may talk about a data set. That means one recording session. OK, now you got to wrap your heads around something here. This, this looks deceptively like the raster plots I showed you at the top of the talk, but they're not. Uh, they're the same in that every horizontal row here is a stream of action potentials. So interpret every black dot as an action potential. Uh, but previously, I was showing you recordings from one neuron for many trials that were being averaged together. But this is one trial and many units, okay? So this is the power of the arrays. In this particular experiment, we got lucky and we had on the order of 220 isolated units. Um, and this shows you the action potentials fired by every one of those units in about a 700 millisecond interval right here, okay? So that's the complete data set obtained on one trial. And the question is how much power can we squeeze out of these kinds of data to tell what's going on inside that monkey's head. So here's the way we got to approach the data. And I have to just take a few methodological moments here for you. Uh, we define a 50 millisecond time window and we count for every neuron, we count how many spikes were emitted during that 50 second time window. Now in, that, in this case, this gives us a vector of 220 elements. And those vectors are just the numbers of spikes fired by every neuron from one to 220. Then we move this uh, window ahead 10 milliseconds and we count a new vector. And then we move it 10 milliseconds further and get a new vector. And by that way, we get a complete uh, recording, a complete representation of the data emitted by these electrode rays over a single trial. Is that, is that clear? And by the way, just pop your hand up. I mean, we're all together here. You know, there's, we don't have this Zoom barrier between us, at least for the people in the room. So I'm quite fine with you popping your hand up. Yeah. 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 Great question. So the question was for those of you in Zoom world, um, uh, are these chronic implants? And the answer is yes, they are. They can stay anywhere from months to years. There is uh, a deterioration in the quality of the recording over time. Um, and, you know, to what extent you're able to maintain recording from the same exactly the same units is a matter of a lot of debate. We know that some of these units are there one day and then they're gone the next day. Some unit will come back on an electrode and it may or may not be the same one. What is true is that the characteristics of the units at that electrode remain constant over a large period of time. So if they're tuned for an arm movement to the right, for example, they and, and the background hash will continue to be tuned for, for movement to the right. Um, but yeah, this is a very nebulous region to be in statistically. You, it, it, you cannot say each day's recording is the same. Neither is each day's recording different. <laughs> so so you, you, you have to be careful with, with some of the statistics here. But thank you for that clarifying question. OK, so what we're going to do now, we're going to take this kind of data right here and we're gonna train a simple decoding algorithm. It's a logistic regression, it's a logistic classifier. It's the simplest kind of linear classifier you can imagine. And we're gonna train, train it on some data that we obtained where we know the answer that the monkey gave at the end. And we'll train the classifier 
and then we'll use it to test on data that we have not trained on. So here's the equation for the logistic classifier. And what, what we're really trying to do here is compute the likelihood that the monkey is going to choose target one, which in our laboratory is usually the rightward target, given that vector of responses, right? That vector of action potential numbers for those 220 or whatever number it happens to be in that experiment, um, and versus the probability that he's going to choose target two, given the same vector of data. And this ratio of uh, the likelihood of choosing target one or target two is called the likelihood ratio. And we take the log likelihood. So some of you may be familiar with the log likelihood of blah, blah, blah. And the equation for it is just a simple linear combination of weightings on the responses of each of the neurons that are recorded. So R sub i out here, that's the response of the ith neuron. And beta sub i is a simple beta coefficient that, that, the, that this is what we're training. We're training up these beta coefficients. And this is how we weight each neuron. So if some neuron, if the algorithm simply does not find it informative in predicting right versus left decisions, beta will be zero for that neuron. If the algorithm says, huh, this one's pretty good, that beta coefficient might be 0.16. And if the algorithm says, whoa, this is really good, it might be 0.3 or 0.4, something like that. But this is just a weighting of beta coefficients. And there are ways to do this you know, in statistically reliable manner, and we do regularization, lasso regularization, all that stuff, uh, uh, tenfold cross-validation, you know, we, we, we try to be statistically responsible here. So what, what does this actually mean? Now, here's a way to visualize it. For those of you for whom this is a strange concept, we have 220 neurons, right? Which means we're operating in 220 dimensions in space. But, um, but imagine that we only had two. So what we're really doing here in this two-dimensional space, we can visualize it. We have a bunch of trials, and on every trial, we have a spike count for neuron one, and we have a spike count for neuron two. And that just positions each trial somewhere in this two-dimensional space. And post hoc, we know which ones the monkeys chose right, which are red, and which one the monkey chose two. And basically, we can put down this line, a discriminant line or, or, or decoder um, that, that actually best discriminates between the clusters of trials that ended in a rightward choice and the clusters of trials that ended in a leftward choice. And that line is just given by this logistic equation up here. So this is the so-called classifier. And you can see in these cartoon data, this classifier is working pretty well. It only makes one mistake on, these, on, on this data set. Now, this is exactly what we're doing in 220 dimensions. You just have to let your mind expand to 220 dimensions instead of two dimensions, and you got the idea. And instead of having a line that's your discriminant, you have what's called a discriminant hyperplane, okay? Now, that gives us a lot of leverage here. So two very useful metrics come out of this. First of all, as this log likelihood develops over time, you can see all these things are a function of time in the equation. Um, and as the log likelihood develops across time, uh, then we can read out what the algorithm, what the classifier believes is the most likely choice at time t, and right or left. And then, of course, we know what choice the monkey made at the end of the trial, so we can say how accurate is the, is the classifier as a function of time during the trial. And knowing the accuracy of your classifier is very, very useful, okay? But there's a second thing that we can know, and this is, I'm just going to introduce this piece of jargon for you, what we call a decision variable. And a decision variable tells you more than which side of the line you're on. It says, how far from the line are you, okay? And that reflects the algorithm's confidence, so to speak, about the prediction of the choice. So for, for both of these two points right here, the algorithm's predicting a leftward choice. Uh, but in one case, it's predicting it with a great deal of confidence. It's saying that this log likelihood ratio here, which is the distance from the, uh, the classifier line, that log, that log likelihood ratio is skewed dramatically in favor of a leftward choice. This one I predict is gonna go left, but that likelihood ratio is not so big. It might go right. The election might go to, we won't get into that. Um, okay, but you get the idea here that there's this decision variable that keeps track of, the, of the, how much evidence the uh, uh, decoder believes it has. Now, I showed you those decoders as a function of time. The reality is that those decoders are very stable across large chunks of time during the trial. And what we have found empirically, and I can show you data for this, 
is that you need one decoder during the dots period while the monkey is looking at the dots right here. If you're going to analyze delay period, you better calculate a different decoder for the delay period because things change subtly. Those beta weights for each neuron, different neurons might be informative during the delay period. And if you want to calculate a decoder out here when the monkey's actually making the movement, uh, that thing changes like crazy. And it's, it's like, uh, for those of you who speak this language, the decoder out here in the post go queue period, that it is orthogonal, these two. These two are, are quite related to each other. They're different, but they have a lot of overlap. But this one has zero overlap with these two. And that's interesting to talk about. The people from Cindy's group will not be surprised to hear this at all. This, this is routine for them. Okay, so here's some data. And these are, these are now decoding predictions calculated on single trials, but averaged across more than 16,000 trials for one monkey here, just to clean up noise and give you an idea of what the, what the time course looks like. So this is with the, when the two targets come on. And of course, the decoder is operating at chance here. Uh, is, uh, the dots aren't even on yet, right? It's just the two targets, the operant targets. Uh, here the dots turn on at zero times zero, and you can see with a very quick latency, under 200 milliseconds on average, uh, this, this, this uh, prediction accuracy departs from 50, departs from chance, and over only a few hundred milliseconds gets well in excess of 90% uh, correct. So it's extremely accurate, and by the time you turn the dots off and you're out of the delay period here, you're up, you know, 95% plus correct. So the decoder is giving us really good a highly reliable readout from about 300 milliseconds after dots onset throughout the end of the trial. Again, once we've averaged out a bunch of noise and I'll, I'll show you what the non-average data look like momentarily. Uh, that's prediction accuracy. That's the first metric we get from the classifier, right? The second one is the one I said is actually more interesting and valuable. It's the, it's the decision variable. So here's the mean decision variable for all trials that ended in rightward choices. And for all trials that ended in leftward choices, and as you would expect, as you would expect, the decision variable is becoming positive for rightward choices and negative for leftward choices. Why would you expect that? Let's actually go back. I should have foreshadowed this. If the classifier sees these two as being equally likely, then this ratio is one and the log of one is zero. All right. So the decision variable of zero means I don't have a clue. But if the if the if the classifier believes that the rightward target is most likely to be chosen, this ratio is positive, and so your DV is going to be positive, greater than one. Uh, this ratio is greater than one, so the DV, the log of something greater than one, will be positive. If target two is most likely, this ratio will be less than unity, and the log will be negative. Okay, so you're going to get positive DVs when it thinks the monkey's going right, and you're gonna get negative DVs when it thinks the monkey's gonna go left. I should have said that. But that's exactly you know, what we see. On trials where the monkey goes left, we get negative DVs. And look, these are not trivial. These are, these are like two or three log units here. They're natural logs, mind you, but, but they, these are substantial metrics and I'll come back to that theme. And this is a couple of log units up here. Now here, I'm splitting these out. This was all rightward choices, whether it was an easy trial or a difficult trial or an intermediate trial. Here we split them out. The dark colors are easy trials where you knew the answer immediately, right? And you can see that this DV, it, it, it departs from chance really early and it rises fast and it stabilizes at some high value up here. And here's the strong motion to the left. And the same thing is just happening down here in negative territory. And then the shades of darkness here uh, are all laddered in a nice order so that uh, when the monkey's uncertain and the evidence is weak, you get these same kind of ramp looking uh, traces, but they have a shallower slope and they take a long time, to, longer time to asymptote, okay? Now, the reason I'm taking time to show you this, yes? Yes. It, the, and I think it does. Uh, I don't have my. Um... No. Okay. So, yeah, this is an interesting. This is an interesting little problem in statistics and probability. If you take a, if I, if you put me at this point in the room, and you tell me to take five steps in random direction, I'm going to wonder. You know, I might wonder where I find that they 
But you can tell me take a hundred steps or a thousand steps. Your intuition might be that I'm going to hover around and I'm going to wind up closer to some way that place. But the word stuck reality is that the more steps you take, the further away you wind up from the horizon. And it gets a smaller and smaller distance. But this is but the more steps you take, the further away you're going to be. Typically. So at zero percent coherence, if you are really integrating that information well, um, you, you're you're actually going to build toward one or the other. There will be a natural tendency to split. And honestly, for those of you who speak this my, this language, I think there are attractor dynamics that go on here that make that acceleration, especially late in the trial, make that acceleration better um, or faster. I should say better. I should just say faster. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for the question. Yes. In the case of the completely random noise, this one's just going to take a guess. Because he's the most random thing I can do with this. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Oh, I, yeah, I should stay by the microphone here. Yes. That's right. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it depends on what you reward the monkey for, what you train the monkey for. If, the, if you reward the monkey for staying put when he's uncertain, then uh, he'll do that. He'll, he, all the monkey wants is the juice, right? The monkey doesn't care about truth. He, he wants the juice and he'll, he'll do whatever you reward him for. A, a clever, I mean, I, I like the way you're thinking and a clever, uh, a clever thing has been done where um, on some trials, the monkey, the monkey will, and this is Rusebe Kiani's work mostly at NYU, uh, the monkey will be, uh, reward, he'll choose one or two, one of the two targets, right? And after he's made his choice, but before any reward or lack of reward has resulted, a third object will come on. And the third target is called the sure bet target. And if the, if the monkey is confident that he has the right choice, he should stay where he is because if he's right, he's going to get two drops of juice. But if he's unsure, he can always change his mind and go to the sure bet and, and be guaranteed, 100% guaranteed of getting one drop of juice, okay? So, so that's called post-decision wagering. You've made your decision and now you're given an opportunity to wager uh, your winnings or lack of winnings. And I was astounded that Ruse Bay could train monkeys to do this, actually. I, 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 this is a pretty sophisticated metacognition and they will do that. They, they understand that and they will do that. And it gives you a metric, an independent metric of the animal's certainty about his decision. And then you can tease our, out uh, certainty from the actual evidence of the decision of itself, which is very cool. Ruse Bay has some very nice papers on that. I'd recommend them to you. Okay, so you guys for your questions are clearly getting the drift here and I should get on with this. Um, everything I've shown you up to now is average data. And the reason I want to show you this is because it touches base with classic literature on decision-making. So this is maybe the most common model for integration of information and decision-making in the field. That doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's the most common. And there are competing models. I'll tell you right off the bat. Um, so we know in the case of motion in the primate cortex, a lot of work done by a lot of people, including my lab and Jing Lu, who's back here on the back seat, back row contributed to, to this work, that uh, neurons in a visual area called the middle temporal visual area, or MT, are predominantly direction selective and speed selective and, and play a major role in calculating motion. But they only tell you what's on the retina momentarily. So if you turn a visual stimulus on right here, the MT cells, if they see their favorite direction of motion and you have a weak motion signal, they'll give you a little step of activity. That step of activity will continue until the dots turn off. And then uh, MT goes back to its resting state. No stimulus on the retina, no activity in MT. If the MT cells see strong motion in their preferred direction, you know, like that easy trial, they'll give a higher step. And then again, uh, the step will go off when the, uh, stimulus disappears. But if you look at a structure uh, that reflects integrated evidence, so the stochastic motion signal is coming out, right? And you're getting a little bit more evidence. That looks like a little bit rightward. This looks like a little bit leftward. Basically, the, if you're really doing literal, literally a mathematical integration of the evidence, the integral of a step is a ramp. 
Okay, and so these ramping signals is what you would predict to see for neural activity that's involved in a decision making. And furthermore, the the ramps should be shallower for the um, weaker motion stimuli because there's less information coming in. And these these ramps of activity will persist out during the delay period. So they should they should maintain their firing rate unless you have a leaky what's called a leaky accumulator of evidence. Uh, they should maintain this when the stimulus goes off. And that's exactly what we see in the data, you know, that have been acquired now from several brain structures from several laboratories. Uh, this is, you know, I think Mike Shadlin and I first showed this in the lateral intraparietal area, but it's been shown in the frontal lobes, it's been shown in the basal ganglia, it's been shown in the superior colliculus. So these kinds of cells exist and are thought to be, and there is some evidence that they are causally involved in making the decision. And I'm touching base with the literature so you can see these kinds of signals are present in the motor cortex as well. Okay, let's talk about, that was just a little side tutorial for those of you for whom this is strange ground, okay? Um, now let's talk about single trial evolution of the decision variable, which is you know the problem I, I posed for you at the beginning. So this is real data now from a single trial Here's the decision variable being plotted. It's hovering around zero. That means the ratio, the likelihood ratio is one, right? And the log of the likelihood ratio is zero. So this is chance. Uh, but here at about 300 milliseconds, the trace departs from chance, goes into strong positive territory, indicating an upcoming rightward decision. Uh, it's, it goes up and down, but stays in positive territory until the ghost signal is obtained and until the monkey makes its choice out here. And by the fact that it's positive, you watch these in the lab and it's really flying across the uh, monitor in real time. Um, and you say he's going to go right and indeed the monkey went right. Here's another trial where instead of becoming positive, this calculated decision variable, and remember this is just the distance from that discriminant hyperplane, right? This is which way the classifier is predicting. It goes into negative territory predicting a leftward choice and indeed the monkey makes a leftward choice out here. Um, there are occasionally trials that do weird things. So here's an example where the sign flips in the middle of the trial. So here the decision variable goes negative, indicating that the classifier believes a leftward choice is coming up, stays negative during a delay period. Uh, but just before the go signal, it has this flip uh, into strong positive territory, meaning the monkey's going to make a rightward decision. And indeed, the monkey makes a rightward decision at the end of this. And so, you know, we want to ask questions about this change in sign here because it looks for all the world like the monkey changed his mind, right? Um, here's an example of another one that actually went into positive territory and then made a flip right here into negative territory and then wound up predicting left and indeed the monkey went left. And so we want to know, are these changes of mind? And if they are, how would we know? Because this is part of that covert region where we have no behavioral readout of what the monkey's doing, right? This is, this is mental states or cognizance neural states, whatever you want to call it. And now we want to know, does it relate to changes of mind? So we're gonna ask these kinds of questions. And you know, it's not just the changes of mind that are interest. In this, what I would call a regularly behaved trial, this decision variable, look at these numbers here. This, this is going from a DV of six here. That's six natural log units. That's three to the sixth power favoring the rightward choice versus the leftward choice. But only a few hundred milliseconds later, it's down to on the order of one to two natural log units, still favoring the rightward choice, but that's now only a three to nine ratio of favoring. And then it comes way up back up here. And so there's a lot of this natural variation. We want to know, is that just noise? Are, are we not recording enough neurons? Are we not counting spikes precisely enough? Um, are there other sources of noise we're not aware of? Or do these kinds of shifts really reflect changes in the animal's decision state? And, and I'll address those for you and show you the answer in just a minute. Yeah. 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 So the best way to answer your question, if, if you want to, in the Q&A session later, if you want to raise this again, I can, we've done neuron dropping analyses. So we've ordered them by their betas, and then we'll take away the one with the biggest beta and calculate the classifier's performance, and take away the next biggest one, calculate the performance. 
And the question we wanted to know was, does the performance of the classifier fall off a cliff at some point when you've eliminated the five or six best neurons? Or is it a graceful decay indicating that this information is actually distributed widely across the population? And the answer is the latter, actually. It's a graceful decay. This does not depend on one or two neurons that give away the game. But I can show you those data. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the, how, how we're gonna do this, you know, we wanna know what, what, what's happening there at that, at that sign change or what's happening with these changes in amplitude of the DV. And so what we decided to do, this is where we join forces with Krishna Shinoi's lab because Krishna Shinoi has beautiful technology for sniffing the signals from these arrays, processing them in real time, and within 10 milliseconds, turning around and telling you what you've really got. So we can calculate this DV here, 10 milliseconds by 10 milliseconds and very close to real time. So we said, well, we'll just do the obvious thing then. Uh, we will stop the trial depending on where the monkey's DV is. So if the monkey's DV is at minus 0.2, we'll just stop the trial right there. And our classifier is predicting, you know, two log uh, units, three times three, basically eight or nine, more likely to choose left and right. And how well is it performing when we just stop it? And we'll stop it at plus one, minus one on some trials, plus two, minus two on some trials, plus three, minus three. We'll just sample, we'll, we'll scan the DB space, right? And say, when we stop it contingent on the state we believe the brain to be in based on these real-time recordings, does it hold up? Does it actually predict the monkey's choices? Um, so this is the real-time setup. We've got two Utah rays. Uh, the spikes, as I've told you, are binned in 50 millisecond windows. They're also part of this real-time calculation as they're Z-scored because you can get overall fluctuations up and down uh, and use Z-score to get rid of those. And then uh, you multiply your vector of spike counts by your vector of beta weights, and that gives you a single number. And that's this linear decoder, and that gives us the real-time decision variable, and we've got it. And we use that real-time decision variable then. Sorry, I've got a latency. I apologize here. Got a latency on my... And, and so we use the real-time decision variable to stop the trial when we want to. So this is, this is we call these closed loop uh, trials because it's a neurally contingent condition for stopping the dots. And remember the monkey's operating here in a variable duration um, task. So the fact that some trials stop early is no big deal. The monkey knows that some trials are gonna stop early and some trials are gonna stop late. So um, we, we made sure that we did not disturb the monkey strategy here. So here's this first closed loop experiment. Um, and the question is about reliability. How does prediction accuracy vary with the DV magnitude? And as I've suggested on single trials, we'll stop the stimulus presentation when a given value of DV, we call this the bound, is reached. And here's a cartoon. And this cartoon illustrates one trial where the DV hits the upper bound. This could be plus two or plus three, whatever you, de you declare you want it to be. Uh, and the trial stops right there. And we ask the monkey, what direction motion did you see? Or here's one where the DV um, uh, drifted down to the lower bound and we stopped the trial right there and said, what did you see? And then here's a couple of examples where the DV never hit the bound. And in that case, the, D, the trial just plays itself out to its preordained duration, right? From 0.4 to 1.2 milliseconds, something like that. 0.4, uh, 400 to 1200 milliseconds. And, you know, just we, we can get, we can scan three to five of these different absolute values each day. Uh, we have some tolerance to make room for noise. We don't want to be making decisions on noise. And we also, just for complete honesty, we have a minimum stimulus duration of 250 milliseconds. So we're out here, we have a blackout period. We know it takes that much time for the visual information to hit these circuits. And we don't want to be responding to noise events that occur out here. So that's a blackout blackout period. Okay, this is real data now. Um, this is an example of a trial uh, that migrated into uh, rightward territory that is positive values of the DV. Here in this experiment, the threshold was plus or minus three. So that's three natural log units of, of probability. And the classifier hit the bound for a rightward choice. And indeed, the monkey made a rightward choice. Here, it hit the bound for a leftward choice. We stopped the trial, said monkey, what direction was it? And he said left. 
And um, here's an example of about a dozen of each of these categories where the monkey ended up with a rightward choice. And you can see uh, you know, that it's hitting the bound and we are correctly predicting the choice in both situations. Um, you wanna know how badly are you cherry picking here? And I will answer that by in the next slide showing you all of the data that were obtained in this experiment for this monkey, all experiments, nothing's excluded here. And what we're doing here is plotting prediction accuracy against the DV that we used for the trigger, right? So in that previous example, we were using a trigger of plus or minus three and at plus or minus three across all the experiments, uh, the, the, when the, the classifier is accurately predicting greater than 95% of the time, okay? So those trials I showed you on the previous slide, they're not cherry picked. Uh, if I showed you all of them, there would be an occasional mistake, okay? But that it's, this is 95% plus accurate for, for three. And it moves on up to 98% if you have higher DVs of four or five, right? But this is really interesting to me. Even if, even for DVs on the order of one, one and a half, that classifier, we're still getting 78% correct, something like that. For even for a DV of one, you've got to take that seriously as reflecting something about that in, animal's internal decision state, right? Because predicting which way he's going to go correctly on 78% of the trials is, is a non-trivial accomplishment. Now, this, this curve, this experimental curve, lies right on top of the curve you would expect in principle from the logistic classifier, which is shown by the dashed line. And, you know, if you're, if you're a grumpy, uh, skeptical person, you would say to me, well, let's see, Bill, you trained a logistic classifier uh, to categorize these choices, and your data are returning a logistic shape function. What is so impressive about that? <laughs> you know, if that, if that were not the case, then you would really have to be worried about what you were doing. And, and I get that grumpy kind of reaction. I might have it myself. But the thing that I remind people of is that, is that all of these classifications, they're based on 50 milliseconds worth of data, okay? Uh, we're not taking the entire history into account when we make that prediction. We're taking when that classifier instantaneously hits the bound, up or down, you know, we stop the trial and ask the monkey then. And, and also we're only recording from 100 to 200 units out of the millions that are there in, in pre-motor and motor cortex. Um, so to me, my, this is astounding to me, my jaw hit the floor when I saw these traces, but you can kind of look at it as a, uh, you know, a cup half empty or a cup half full. But I think at the very minimum, what it means is that when we see trials like this, and we see the decision variable fluctuate from plus six to plus two. Um, we have to take that seriously as a reflection of the monkey's internal decision state, his internal mental state, if you'll allow me to use that word. You have a question or is, or, no, okay. Okay, um, and, and it, it even means when you see them this small down on the order of one, a DV of one, you've got to take them seriously here because we know we've got 78% leverage or something there. Okay, so I'm going to show you closed loop experiment two in somewhat less detail. And closed loop experiment two builds on the first, and this is about the changes of mind. So we want to know how can we validate these putative changes of mind. Now remember, all we've got are neurons, right? All we've got are spike trains. That's all we've got. And the sign of the decision variable is changing from plus to minus. And we're saying that's a putative change of mind. And again, you know, the question is, how do you know? How do you validate the commitment states before and after these putative neural changes of mind? So the experiment is, and you cannot go back and mine your previous data. You got to do new experiments here, but now you're going to stop the stimulus presentation once a putative COM has been detected. So instead of stopping it on a particular value of the DV, you're going to combine that with its previous history to detect COMs, and you're going to stop the trial after a COM and see how well the DV is predicting the monkey's choice. Is that, that pretty, pretty clear? I mean, it's pretty qualitative, but here's an example. So this is a cartoon again. So, um, you know, this is, this is a, something that's going, a DV is going into positive territory, but here it flips and changes sign and goes into negative territory. And after this putative change of mind, we stop and ask, 
how um, you know we stop the trial and say what what direction was it in, and similarly for this one, and um, here's one where it hit the bound and had no change of mind. So you know we're looking for these change of mind. Now, they only happen on one to four percent of the trials, something like that. So it's kind of like looking for a needle in the haystack, but. Uh, you know, this is an advantage of having a monkey that'll do a thousand, two thousand trials in a day. So we we have we def, we try to define these COMs carefully and conservatively. Um, so we we insist that after a COM, here's a putative COM change of mind, and it has hit some uh, bound that we specify. It looks like the DV is two that we're specifying here. And we insist that it not only reached two after the change of mind, but that it had been minus two before the change of mind. And furthermore, we insist that it had been stable in each of those states for 150 milliseconds. So we're not looking at little, you know, little staticky uh, blimps. We're, we're trying to be very conservative here. And then we just do a bunch of experiments until we can obtain these data. And, uh, you know, here's an example of a trial that qualifies. Uh, for rightward choice, and here's one that qualifies changing from leftward, uh, sorry, from rightward to a leftward choice. So now we can do the same analysis I showed you a few slides ago. Well, these are just some more example trials. These are changes of minds for rightward choices right here, and these are changes of mind trials for leftward choices. And we can do the same set of experiments, and we can plot uh, after all of these changes of mind, uh, plot how well the classifier is predicting the monkey's choices uh, against what we would expect from the logistic. And you can see that the prediction accuracy is good. It's rising monotonically with the decision variable, okay? But it's not as good as the previous data I showed you from this monkey. It's not lying right on the line for the logistic classifier, which means there must be something else going on here, okay? And it may be something about the history. And we have some partial evidence in analyzing the data that the history, um, how, how rapidly that thing was changing its sign has some effect here. Uh, for the second monkey, it looks just the same. This is the only, um, this is the only slide I'm showing you data from two monkeys because it's the only one where the two monkeys differed. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have this, this hint over here that there's more going on with the history, but you cannot, perhaps to get the best prediction, you can't just count what's happened in the last 50 milliseconds uh, and ignore everything that went before. Uh, there, there's probably something else here, but still, this is very good, right? You're getting up to 85% or so prediction. Okay, what do we know about changes of mind from human psychophysics? Well, we know quite a bit from this beautiful paper by Resolage et al. that appeared in Nature in 2009. They had people doing this random dots task uh, and the, the people were indicating their judgment of right versus left motion by moving, putting pressure on a joystick that moved a cursor to this location or to this location. And for most trials, the cursor goes straight out there to one location or the other location. Few trials where loopy things occur. The cursor starts toward the left, but then it loops back around to the right while the person is still looking at the dots. And they would ask the person what happened. He said, ah, oh, that was a tough trial. I thought it was left, but I changed my mind in the middle. I mean, the humans would literally report that, which of course monkeys cannot literally report. And so they could identify, these guys could identify change real psychophysical change of mind trials. And they found statistical regularities that are cool and interesting. They found that changes of mind are less likely for stronger motion stimuli. That's logical, right? They found that changes of mind are more likely to correct a mistake than vice versa. Now that makes sense. If you get a, a small sample of dots and you think it's right or left, but then you get more samples of dots and so that you get a better idea of the integrated value, that's more likely to give you a correct choice in the end than to lead you into a mistaken choice. So this is intuitive also. And the changes of mind are more likely earlier in the trial. That makes sense because early in the trial, you don't have, you have more information coming to you, right? So, so the deeper you get into the trial, the more information you've integrated, the less likely you should be to change your mind. Yeah, this is the last data slide. So, so the, I call these indirect tests one to three about whether our putative neural changes of mind are real or whether they're um, illusory, something we are just making up. And the thing that we did, that Diogo did, 
and Jesse did were, was to take um, our putative neural changes of mind and look and see whether they showed these same regularities that were evident in human psychophysics. And the answer is yes, they do. And that's published in this paper right here, uh, appeared in Nature earlier this year. Uh, and so we believe these are real changes of mind because they correspond so nicely to the statistical regularities in the human psychophysics. So I'm going to skip those. Uh, there was a there was a third a third uh, uh, ex closed loop experiment, but it's okay. You can read the paper if you're interested. So I'll leave you with these conclusions: that uh, using linear decoding of hundreds of simultaneously recorded neurons, we can a predict choices with high accuracy well before movement onset. And we can decode in real time on single trials the decision variable. And also, we can identify these candidate COMs in real time on, on single trials. So, in real time closed loop experiments, the candidate changes of mind predict the decision outcome on single trials with accuracy that varies monotonically with the decoded DV, though so not as good as on the non change of mind trials for that one monkey. And then I, this is the experiment that I skipped over and I didn't show you, but I can tell you that stimulus perturbation. So if you go in and put little pulses of motion uh, while the monkey is seeing the steady stream of motion, the stimulus perturbations have more impact on the decision outcome when introduced at lower DV values. In other words, if the monkey is kind of uncertain and the DV values are lower um, and you put a little extra pulse of motion in there, you can move both the monkey's choices slightly and the neural DVs slightly. But if you do that at high DVs, high DVs, you, you, you see very little movement. That means that the accumulation of evidence process is not strictly linear, and it becomes more nonlinear at higher DVs, which smacks of attractive dynamics for those of you who are interested in that stuff. So it's uh, it may be the evidence for a decision bound. So I'll just end where I started back there with Kasparov. That the decoded DV makes covert, transient aspects of the decision process accessible for study for the first time, I think. Um, and I think this is a baby step in a good direction. We're not to the level of being able to read out what a chess player is thinking uh, while playing chess, but uh, we've got to get through some kind of steps like this. Maybe in the modern days of machine learning and stuff, we can, who knows, maybe we can even pull signals like this out of the EEG. I mean, I don't know. That's if I had, if I was going to work on this for another five years, uh, that might be, that might be the steps, the direction I'd want to go in. Uh, but in general, beware of this. We're going to see a lot more of this, right? But in general, beware of the validation problem because the validation is a tricky business. Uh, we, if we had not done that um, closed loop um, experiment, I don't, we'd still be speculating to this day about the meaning of those uh, pronounced variations in the DV during the during the trial. So beware of the validation problem. Thank you for your audience for being a patient audience and I'm happy to answer a few questions if you have time. In the back. No, well, that's a cool question. So the, the question is, uh, the, the question is, you know, we are, we are in, in experiment one, closed loop experiment one, we're waiting for the DV to hit the bound, and then we're stopping the experiment, and we are um, rewarding the animal for uh, a correct choice, but the monkey has to go ahead and make his choice in order to get the reward. And the question is, kind of like uh, what some of the motor prosthetic people are doing, could you reward the animal just for moving the DV up there neurally uh, without ever having to make the, uh, the arm movement at all? Do I understand your question? Yeah. And I, I think the question is, yes, you could do that. Um, so I think, you know, there, there's been some speculation out in the literature. It's not a lot of papers, but it's a few papers about cognitive prosthetics 
I mean, you, you this would this would in some sense be a cognitive prosthetic, right? That you, you read out decisions that people want to make. I mean, it's not that far removed from moving the arm, um, but you can imagine this kind of thing going on in attention and tracking attention states during single trials or tracking memory states during single trials, right? I, I this is not a uh, I don't think this is an esoteric uh, approach or esoteric um, application, and I, and I think those kinds of questions that you're alluding to and encourages you to think, encourages all of us to think about the possibility of prosthetics that go far beyond just simple motor domains and into higher level cognitive domains. Yes. Yeah, with each monkey, okay? So, in the beginning, we had no idea how state well, I'm sorry, the questions about the decoding algorithms, the, the vector beta weights, and how stable are they? And do you have to train it for each monkey? Do you have to train it for each day? Um, how just basically how stable are those decoders? The answer is yes, you certainly have to train it for each monkey. Uh, but you know, we were very uncertain about the answer to this at the beginning. So we were collecting. Uh, training data, 100, 200 trials of training data at the beginning of each day, and just so that you know we we wouldn't make any mistakes. But we discovered just empirically that those things are stable, and we would um, use use some of them for a week. I think the furthest we ever pushed one was out to 19 days, something like that, um, and they continued performing really well. So if we ever started noticing the monkey's performance degrading in, in ways that seem odd to us, then we immediately stop, collect some more training data and, and tweak up the algorithm. But mostly, mostly we just got into the habit of doing it every Monday morning, you know, and you have two days off. You come back, let's train that decoder up again and we're off, we're good for the week. So they're pretty stable, surprising. Oh. Oops. Do I have access to that? This one. Okay, I may have missed this earlier, but in terms of decoding, how did the array location, PMD versus M1, more or less strongly contribute to outcome? For example, was M1 less effective at decoding choice, particularly for changes of mind? So, great question. And um, Diogo's paper comparing M1 and uh, PMD is on BioArchive right now. It's been sitting out there for quite a while. I'm, I, I am embarrassed to say that that's largely my fault um, and I need to do something about that. Yeah, go if you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the answer in general is it wouldn't surprise people who know uh, PMD M1 literature is that in general, PMD becomes predictive of choice before M1 does, and it reaches somewhat better prediction, although M1 catches up with it eventually. Uh, but there is this striking finding that's the core of that paper that's out there on BioArchive, that if you, if that, that statement that I just made, that, that PMD is more predictive and becomes more predictive more quickly, that only holds under conditions where you have a fixed duration task and the monkey knows how much time he has to make the choice. As soon as you put him into a variable duration task where he doesn't know, am I only going to have 200 milliseconds or am I going to have 1200 milliseconds? Then everything gets accelerated. Both PMD and M1 get accelerated in their dynamics and M1 mostly catches up with PMD. And you look at it and they're, it's like they're acting as a unit. And PMD, you can still demonstrate like a 19 millisecond latency gap between M1. M1 still coming on about 19 milliseconds later than PMD. But man, it, the prediction accuracy is, is accelerating and getting to high levels. And there's really something about that uncertainty that seems to put a gun to the monkey's head. You know, it's what some of the modelers and modeling drift diffusion models call urgency. And so you rack up, ratchet up the gain knob on your on your model. So it's uh it's but changes mind. I don't think we actually looked. I don't know if Diogo actually looked to see if M1 or PMD was coding changes of mind better. Those data are perfectly obtainable. Diogo's code is obtainable, so we can look at that. But I don't. I don't remember that. I'm looking at the back of the room. I should be looking down here. That's a good question. Thank you. 
Yes. No, but I, I should say that we have not looked really, really carefully. Um, you know, mostly we're monitoring the animal's eye and his hand. So we have continuous recordings of eye and hand. Um, and you could look to see, okay, if we have these neural changes of mind, and we believe they're really changes of mind, the monkey's got his finger on the fixation point, right? But is he, is he cheating slightly one way or the other? If we looked at micro finger movements or micro eye movements, could we see it? Uh, or if we looked at pupil, we also have pupilometry data. You know, could we see it? And uh, again, I think data's, Diogo's done some cursory looks at that and not been rewarded for it. So he gave up and, uh, you know, but I, I don't know that it's been. Uh, yeah, we, we have seen nothing so far. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means in some preliminary looks, because we didn't want to miss it if it were there. In some preliminary looks, it wasn't there. In the back, yeah. And then over on the side. That's a great question. That's a really good question. And, and I can, I believe that the dynamics that we see in PMD and M1 reflect both of those. I think they're a window onto the evidence accumulation process, especially early. So we have independent psychophysical evidence that's in that file archive paper about what the actual integration window of these monkeys is. And we think it's on the order of 400 to 500 milliseconds. So even if a monkey gets 1.2 seconds worth of dots, he doesn't perform any better than he does at 500 milliseconds. So you can see them getting better and better and better as, as they go from 200 out to 500 milliseconds. So implying that they're really integrated. But once you get beyond 500, um, we have no independent psychophysical evidence that they are integrating. I think they're likely not. But these curves on what I'm calling the DD continue to come apart after 500 milliseconds. Okay, the dynamics, the neural dynamics are continuing. Um, a, a person who thinks about attractor dynamics would find that not surprising at all. They would find it odd if you weren't continuing to migrate along to some attractor state. But um, I can give you another piece of information that's really important. We've gone and looked at these at single cell levels. We've done traditional analysis of single cells. And we've looked at when individual cells actually become choice predictive, okay? And there are some individual cells that become choice predictive very early during the likely psychophysical integration interval, but there are some that don't become late, uh, active until late. In fact, there are some that don't really turn on and become choice predictive until during the delay period. And that can possibly be integrating visual information, right? I mean, I've, I've just made an argument to you that cells that come on eight or 900 milliseconds into the visual period, they're probably not integrating visual information. Or if they are, they're not contributing to the monkey's actual decision process. But, but so we, I think that PMD and M1 are, as you suggest, they not only reflect the accumulation of evidence that likely is being done initially someplace else and those signals pass the PMD and M1, but PMD and M1 are probably doing this additional thing, which is preparing for action. Once the DB gets to a certain level and PMD and M1 or the monkey become reasonably certain about what that future course of action is going to be, I think you start getting these late neurons coming on that are in some sense um, preparing it to, to do the action. So you just asked me for my unvarnished opinion and that's my opinion, but there's a lot of opinion in there as, as opposed to hard data, more interesting research. Yes, sir. The logistic? Yeah. Not looked at that. It's, it's possible. Another 
the, the, the strategic income double it or triple it uh, might might have more impact than a single like coming out of the Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. You mean you mean like symptom spot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And we have not looked at that at all either. So yeah. So synchrony is another thing that could be to be looked at. It's it's been a lot of uh you need another chapter. Great, <laughs> but thanks for just reminding all of us that just because we started with dead easy later doesn't mean understand what we're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.